Supposed Biblical Error Were there Pharisees in Galilee before 70 AD? The Gospels record that Jesus interacted with Pharisees numerous times throughout his ministry in Galilee. However, Robert Price has argued there were no Pharisees in Galilee prior to 70 AD. So Pharisees in, in Galilee, the same thing. There weren't any until they were forced out of Jerusalem by the Romans in 70 AD. Yet the Gospels have uh, Jesus pursued by Pharisees in Galilee. It's anachronistic. Now this clip is about 10 years old, and I cannot find Price making this claim since then. So I'm not sure if he still argues the Gospels are in error when they record that there were Pharisees in Galilee prior to 70 AD. However, even with that, the claim still needs to be addressed, regardless if Price has abandoned this argument or not. First, it is important to note there are very few sources on what happened inside Galilee from the first century prior to 70 AD, and no sources say there were no Pharisees present. Second, Sean Frayne suggests there is circumstantial evidence in the works of Josephus that Shamite Pharisees were active in some parts of Galilee prior to the Jewish war. Pharisees were mostly divided into two sects, the Shamites and the Halalites. The Shamites were the more radical sect and were mostly responsible for the war with Rome that ended in the destruction of the temple in 70 AD. Frayne says there are reasons to think they were active in Galilee prior to this period. First, he mentions how Josephus records that the religious rulers in Jerusalem decreed that Herod Antipas's palace should be destroyed because it contained representations of animals on it, which went against their law. Someone named Jesus, the son of Saphius, led men from the area and accomplished the task. Later, Josephus records that this Jesus, son of Saphius, was at Tarachia brandishing the laws of Moses. This implies there were zealous Jews that sound like Shamite Pharisees in Galilee prior to 70 AD. Another peculiar incident is that just before the Jewish war, Jews in Tarachia refused to grant asylum to Gentile refugees without the men first being circumcised. Josephus records that he had to pacify the multitude on this issue, suggesting this was not just an issue for a minority present, but a larger number of the Jews present. Next, Frayne mentions another incident. Someone named John the son of Levi offered oil for those Jews who inhabited Caesarea Philippi. Since they had no oil that was pure for their use, he would provide a sufficient quantity of such oil for them, lest they should be forced to make use of oil that came from the Greeks and thereby transgress their own laws. Frayne says, the concession shows that the question of the Jewish use of pagan oil had been an issue since early Hellenistic times. Although the evidence is not conclusive, Frayne suggests these three examples from prior to 70 AD reflect a Jewish text that stem from the school of Shammai. It is indeed striking that these three examples from Galilean life immediately prior to the Great Revolt suggest links with the more radical expression of Jewish separation, which was the underlying support for the revolt. Beyond this, there are other indicators that support the notion of Pharisees in Galilee. We hear of Eliezer, a Jew that came out of Galilee, who convinced the king of Adiabene to be circumcised sometime in the early 50s, which indicates zeal for the law associated with Pharisaic thought. During the days of Herod the Great, there was someone called Judas the Galilean who led a revolt and was said to be zealous for the law. John Kloppenborg adds that prominent Pharisees like Gamaliel II were active in Galilee immediately after the Jewish war. The fact that immediately after the war, Gamaliel II, Eliezer ben Heracanus, and others were active in Galilee probably means that some foothold had been gained prior to 70 CE. In all likelihood, Pharisees in Galilee would likely have served as retainers for the religious elites in Jerusalem. This is not to say there were Pharisees everywhere in Galilee, or that there were as many as there were in Judea. But the evidence does suggest there were at least pockets of Pharisaic strongholds that Jesus would have encountered. Some might try to bring up a quote attributed to the Pharisee, Yohanan ben Zakkai, where he claimed Galileans hated the Torah. But scholars have argued this is a late attribution that is likely fake, even if it represents what he thought about Galilee, Frayne says, Presumably, Yohanan went to Galilee as the representative of Jerusalem scribism, rather than as an advocate for the Pharisaic sect, and we must be careful to keep the two separate, no matter how much our sources tend to identify them.
or how closely their views correspond in practice. His point being, there probably were regional differences in religious traditions, but that alone doesn't mean there were no Pharisees in Galilee, only that there were religious differences between the scribes of Jerusalem and the Pharisees of Galilee, similar to how there were differences between the Shamites and the Hillelites. Furthermore, evidence in the Gospel suggests knowledge of Pharisaic customs and rules from before 70 AD. Jacob Neusner argues Jesus' statements in Matthew and Luke about cleaning the outside of the cup but not the inside is evidence of Shamite Pharisee purity laws from prior to 70 AD, when the Shamites had more control. The Shamites and the Halalites disagreed on the proper way to wash cups. In the Gospels, Jesus used the Shamite rule as a polemic against them, instead of the Halalite rule, which suggests a saying originated to a time before the dominance of the Halalite school in Galilee. The Christian saying certainly originated from a knowledge of the Shamite view of the law, and at a time in which the Shamite version was binding. So the New Testament saying, whether or not by Jesus, derives from the period of Shamite predominance, that is, before 70. After 70 AD, the evidence suggests the Shamite view on washing was not as popular as it once was, so it is unlikely to have been a saying invented after 70 AD. Greg Boyd also notes that Mark in the other Gospels accurately describes the political landscape of the religious community in the region. In Mark, the scribes are a distinct group from the Pharisees and Sadducees, and they come up to Galilee from Jerusalem, which is accurate in terms of group distinctions and where the scribes were headquartered. Mark also accurately gets that there was a position known as the scribe of the Pharisees, and he also is correct when he portrays that there were no Sadducees in Galilee. Mark also differentiates between elders, chief priests, and teachers of the law. But these distinctions ceased to exist after 70 AD. As Martin Hengel notes, after 70, this whole pluralistic political and religious landscape, which Mark depicts quite accurately in broad outline, was destroyed. Boyd notes that because Mark gets all these distinctions and details right, it suggests that an AD pre-70 dating is more reasonable than an AD post-70 dating. Thus, given the data, it seems we have good circumstantial evidence to suggest there was Pharisaic influence in Galilee prior to 70 AD, and the internal evidence in the Gospels suggests the authors were knowledgeable of Pharisaic customs and thought. Given this, there are good reasons to trust the Gospels when they report Pharisees in Galilee, instead of assuming they are in error. Ultimately, one can also point out the Gospels are historical sources, and there is little to no evidence to suggest that they are wrong on this issue. So why is the principle of charity not applied? Why are the Gospels not treated like other ancient sources when they report customs and events? In other words, why is it for some skeptics the Bible is always guilty until proven innocent?